E-bike component rundown, mid-drive, check. Rear shock absorber with a full suspension pivot system, check. 1000 watts of power, check. These features all describe the Fat HS from Unero, a brand I've covered before. One of my favorite e-bikes is a Unero, the Z1. I've also reviewed their e-torque model, and as a matter of fact, at the beginning of that video, I noted that I thought I was getting a Fat HS then. Links in the description for both of those reviews, but today, the Fat HS, finally. Almost, because it's still trying to elude me. This is a review bike, and it's been through quite a few hands, and somewhere along the way, the box became less than a box, and stuff started coming out the holes, like the charger. It wasn't there. Plus, for whatever reason, it was shipped last, with a few curiously removed parts, like the front brake caliper, so goodbye caliper mount, and hello, new brake pads, because do you know what happens to an open caliper when the brake levers are saran wrapped to the handlebars? And I don't understand this either, but the derailleur. It was removed from the hanger. It was just dangling there and at some point brushed up against the hanger doing damage to the threads. The keys though loose in the box laying at the bottom made it through fine. Don't get me wrong though, I'm not complaining, I'm just sharing my experience because a few added parts later and a borrowed charger from another e-bike and here it is. First impressions are that this certainly looks like a trail beast and that was my nickname for it going in the beast. This medium 17 inch frame with its thick sturdy pivots and the tapered head tube and of course a mid drive. And let's go over all this in a parts rundown but I want to start off with one of the curious choices and that's the RST guide suspension fork. Now there is nothing wrong with RST forks and this one has a manual lockout and I even like that they put their name on the preload adjuster. But 75 millimeters of travel on this bike. We'll see how that works out. At the very least, the arch support's strong and it holds the blaze light headlight. The hub's Quando branded. These are sealed bearing and both wheels, front and rear. A little redundant there, but they're both quick release. Tires huge. These are big fat tires. 26 by 4.0. These are Kenda juggernauts. The rims wide too to accommodate those big tires. And getting those tires rolling, a mid-drive. A buffang mid-drive. 1000 watts of power which is doubly cool but a curiosity here also this isn't a torque mid drive this is a cadence sensor midi so cadence no torque but it does have a gear sensor to cut power during shifts and that's going to help not only the motor and the chain but also the shifty parts in the back which are shimano the derailleur a deor and this is a good mountain bike caliber derailleur shimano for the cassette as well it's a nine speed of course, one of the benefits of a mid-drive, no hub motor, so that means quick release for this rear wheel, as I've already mentioned, both wheels quick release. Brakes hydraulic, the specs say Unero design, I say Shimano knockoffs, 180 millimeter rotors front and rear. Up top, a Neko branded headset, and that's gonna mean sealed bearings, which is good, and a sort of longish stem, at least long in my opinion, the handlebars are zoomed, 700 millimeters wide, which I think are quite narrow for this bike, but they are 31.8 millimeter diameter. Bar complements start with the Shimano Dior trigger shifter, which is nice and a good companion to that Dior derailleur. The grips, lock-ons, and these kind of resemble the Bontrager grips that I've used recently, just with a less pronounced texture. Here's the other half of the Unero hydraulics, and I say Unero with quotes. Note that these have a cutoff sensor, very important on e-bikes, especially cadence sensor e-bikes. There's the cutoff sensor, the gear selecting cutoff sensor, and then a speed sensor. All these feed data to the bike's computer, which is visualized on the CD C6 LCD display. It's brighter in person, more detail on it later. The input selections are via a four button switch on the left side of the handlebars, and beside that, the thumb throttle. Also on the left side, but at the down tube, is the bike's charge port, and also this port, which is for the optional second battery. A battery that unfortunately I don't have, but I'm told can really increase the range of the bike. On this alloy 17-inch frame is a quick-release seat post clamp for the Promax seat post, and a saddle that came moved as far back as it could physically go. Beyond the acceptable adjustment points for this saddle, but I figured out why. This frame should fit me perfectly at 17 inches, and whoever rode this last must be about the same height as me because the reason it's all the way back is that this crank set, in relation to the seat post and the seat, it too is further back than normal, and that makes it kind of weird. More on that in a minute. For now, note that this saddle, it's a Nebula model from Cell Royal. So the saddle, kind of fancy, the kickstand, not as much. 
As a whole, this bike definitely looks like a trail beast, and the mix of components, I'll say some impressive, some a bit curious to me. Trail looks so naturally street. For the first shots, only enough to find out that the top speed, 26 indicated, 27 GPS verified, close to the 28 it's rated, and pleasurable enough that I can accelerate and decelerate with no hands. On the trail, it's a bit of a mixed bag, and this is the second trail because I had to seek out smoother trails. My first go was at Wildwood, where on that soul sucker entry, Climb. When I complain about a lot, it does make it quite a bit easier. At least the pedaling, because it quickly became evident that the roots at Wildwood, you know, this is a 73 pound bike. It's rated at 77, I'm assuming that's with both batteries. I weighed this one at 73 and I had to slow it down. Because that fork, it does get jarry. Remember, only 75 millimeters of travel and I didn't want to rattle it or myself too much. That's not to say fun can't be had, because on specific sections like Powerline, which has recently been smooth, that's the fastest and flowiest section of Wildwood, the bike, 99% of it does great, but that fork, it's still, I think, possibly too much for it here, because I can see subtle bits of back flex. But it does do the best of many bikes that I've ridden, including e-bikes going up the steep climb at the end of Powerline. This chugs right up it. And trust me, that hill's so steep, I've pushed plenty of bikes up it, including e-bikes. And here, a guy that's much more fit than me. Soccer player fitness, and he's pushing. But I didn't have to push today, thanks to this 1,000 watt motor and its 160 newton meters of torque. But that torque can be a double-edged sword, because remember me saying this is a 73-pound bike. Pair that with a fork that's really under-specced, and it does become a lot to maneuver if going too fast. So I learned to stay under 15 miles per hour on trails, unless it's a straightaway. 13 seems to be the sweet spot. Quick jump to the other side of town and trail number three, one I haven't ridden in quite a while, and I don't remember being this rooty. Of course, this could also just be this RST guide fork being lesser than what I've ridden on this previously. But this is a good place to show the rear suspension travel at work. See the rear tire here going up and down. That's not bounce, that's the pivot system at work. The rear suspension as a whole works quite well and is mountain bike worthy in my opinion. Other than the fork, which is really my only complaint, there are three or so other things that are worth note. Number one, on my third trip down the Powerline Trail at 26 miles per hour, the battery door fell off and I ran over it. Surprisingly, it didn't warp it, it went right back on and that problem never happened again. So too with the one chain drop that I had. This was curious because I was on flat ground and possibly a stick came up and hit it because this bike has a chain guide and it came off on the inside of the bottom of the chain ring. So very bizarre, never happened again. And then there's the cadence factor because remember this is a cadence sensor mid-drive, not a torque based mid-drive. And with cadence sensors, there's always that little bit of lag between when you quit pedaling and the bike quits putting out power. Usually that lag is very short, and on this bike they did a good job. It's very short, but there's always that one time where it just takes almost a second, and that can creep up on you and cause a spin out. And at the wrong time, that can send the bike tumbling over, or worse, I'm fortunate I was paying attention, but even then it kind of crept up on me. That's why all the high-end e-mountain bikes are torque-based, and why this is such a bizarre decision. They went with a Bafang mid-drive, why not use a torque mid-drive? And the location of the mid-drive, this 17-inch frame should fit me perfectly, but it does not. The reach is actually fine, but where that mid-drive sits, it's too far back, and my feet versus where I sit on the saddle just doesn't work for me. Perhaps it's like buying shirts. Sometimes you just need to size up. Maybe this should be a large to fit me better. Now, I did let two riders shorter than me ride this, and they loved it. They thought the fit was great, so there's that. So maybe I just need to get my hands on a large frame version of this bike, because overall, there is a lot to like here. The looks, number one, because this looks like the beast that I call it, and the buffet. After three rides, once I learned how to work with that shifting sensor, torque would still be better, but this is, on its own merits, nice and spunky. The rear suspension, usably adjustable. I like Exaform, and this is Exaform powered, and I'm very happy, as I've already mentioned, with this setup as a trail bike. The brakes, these Unero branded copies of Shimano, they stop the bike perfectly well. And I've mentioned this a few times already, but it's worth another mention. This is a balanced bike. No rear hub motor weight. That mid-drive keeps all the weight with the battery right above it. They're in the middle and low. And when I'm not running over it, the battery door comes off easy for quick access to the battery. With the turn of a key, the battery itself drops out. This has an integrated carry handle, but no real markings. The only thing that I can find on it is a sticker that shows the 48 volts, 14 amp hours. No cell information does have a built-in charge port. 
Here's a look at the bike's speed controller and computer. Now, I do see some tampering on these wires as well as some missing screws on the battery. And these review bikes do not have an easy life, so the fact that this one still works is a testament, I guess. And that second battery that I talked about earlier, it mounts on these triple bosses. And I've already shown the port where it plugs in. Again, sadly, I don't have a second battery, but they say up to 80 miles range. And let's talk about range. In my time with this bike thus far, in three charges, I've had as low as six. That was full trail riding, highest pedal assist, and as high as 24. When I received this bike, it only had 30 miles on it, so I know it hasn't been range tested, so I'm going to follow up in a second video. I'm thinking after 100 miles. Controlling all the computer settings, simple, and this display more visible in person, as I've already mentioned, plus or minus to cycle through the five pedal assist modes, each have sub-labels, eco, standard, and turbo. Turbo is where I like to stay. And along with the odometer, there's a trip meter and a ride timer. I also want to give them extra credit for using Shimano Deor. That's a good mountain bike caliber component, and they could have cheaped out here. Most e-bike manufacturers do, but they didn't. Things I would change the pedals. They get slippery on a 73-pound bike moving around on a trail. Also, if someone's going to buy this bike, they're probably going to want to change the fork if they plan on any actual trail riding. Also, note that this is more of a medium rather than a normal medium. It's on the small side, so size up. Out of the box, I would say this is okay as a trail bike for smooth trails. Probably overkill for city streets, but if you want to ride a bike like this on city streets, you do you. To me, this bike has a lot of potential, but does potential in $27.99 mesh well? That's for the shopper to decide and for you to comment. So share your thoughts and let me hear what you have to say. I'll put a link down in the description if you want to head over to their website and check out more detail because they do have further specs on this. Give this video a thumbs up if you found it helpful. Be sure you subscribe. If you haven't already, make sure you have the notification bell active. Thanks for watching Kev Central and have a great day.